Hey, y'all. Welcome. Welcome back to Interstage Window, my Saturday stream, which I always have with my friends. And today with me here is Landon. Say hi, Landon. Hi, Landon. Hey. And welcome in, Kitty. I see you got the first today. Thank you so much. I'm so excited. I'm so excited. Landon, what are we talking about today? We're talking about Sailor Moon Crystal Season 3 in the name of reboots. In the name of reboots. Oh my God, you guys. Oh my God. I'm so excited to talk about this season. I'm so excited. To talk it's going to be so season. fun. Yes. Um, but as ever, we just want to warn for those of you watching that Enter Stage Window is not a spoiler free uh, stream. We will be talking about all the things Sailor Moon related to Crystal as well as the 90s version. So if you don't know what's going on, get caught up or you've been warned. <laughs> yeah, I mean, um, I feel like at this point, if you if you if you care, you would know, but we will be talking about it. Um, so hopefully, yeah. Oh, my gosh. Anime Girls Super Kawaii is back. Hey, Hello. good morning. Good morning. Thank you so much for coming back um, to talk with us about my favorite season and how uh, Crystal rendered it. I'm so excited. I'm so excited. Okay, here we go, you guys. Let's let me show you. Let me show you our beautiful PowerPoint. Ooh. Ooh. Crystals beautiful. all around. <laughs> <laughs> but yes, we are not spoiler free. Um, so if you don't know what happened in Sailor Moon Crystal Season 3, we're going to tell you all about it. And we'll probably mention things in uh, in other sections as well. But let's get started like we do every single time and talk about our favorite things. So Karen... What is your favorite thing from season three? Oh my gosh. Oh my gosh. The whole season. The whole season. But <laughs> but what I chose um, to talk about for favorite things is Michiru or Sailor Neptune. I just had this like absolute like obsession with her in the 90s. I think the way that she's rendered in Crystal is absolutely fabulous. I think she has the best color palette of all of the sailor guardians it's truly and the green hair it's it truly is the green hair <sighs> okay girls just want to be green you guys okay girls just want to be green this is yes. what we have learned from so many things um sailor neptune was a pioneer uh but you know now that the she hulk show is out we know girls just want to be green um and i wanted to be green and she was like and she was like all about the ocean and she had like the coolest girlfriend and she was like a violinist. And at the time, I don't know, I, I don't know how many of our viewers know this, but in high school I played clarinet and I was in the, the marching band and the symphonic band and I was in all the bands. Right. And I was actually first chair by the time I got to my senior year, like, cause I was really good. But then, um, then I went to college and I just, I just did other, other things and forgot all about music. But once upon a time, once upon a time, I was actually really good at, at music stuff, um, if you would not believe. So when they they had her come on and she was like this uh, this beautiful, um, you know, violinist. And uh, I was like, oh, my God, my heart. And then, of course, as you guys know, my favorite characters tend to be not quite as developed. Right. I like the characters that I can imprint a little bit on. So when she came on, I was like, all right, you know, Sailor Venus, like, I love you. But can you just like. What, let's just like if you could go over there for like just five minutes. I have um new girlfriend and uh, and, and we're gonna make the the best RPs ever and uh, and yeah. So I just I love her. She you can literally epic. see Sailor V in the background of the screenshot, just being like, <laughs> actually, you're just putting her on a shelf. Uh, <laughs> I will come back to you later, friend. <laughs> uh, I do have to admit that the reason why I started playing violin when I was a kid is because of future. Is she look makes I, it look so cool, doesn't I she? Like, I was like, she's so pretty, and she has such a pretty cousin girlfriend. Mm. <laughs> <laughs> we'll talk about that in a second. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, I was just like, and I just want to be green, so I want to play the violin, and I did, and I sucked yeah. at it. But fun facts: <laughs> I, I heard violin is very hard. I've never tried it um, personally, yes. and I also <laughs> don't have a musical bone in my body. Oh, I'm so sorry. So, I'm so sorry. I'm just like, <laughs> beat. What is beat? What is tempo? What is music? 
Mm-hmm. <laughs> Poor Landon. <laughs> Poor me. Um, yeah, say, uh, Sailor V literally in the background there. You are so right, anime girls. Um, yeah, and then her talisman was a mirror, which I thought was like the coolest thing because I was like, oh, you know, Hotaru has the sword and Sailor Pluto has like her, you know, garnet orb scepter thing. Um, but Michiru's is, is not really a weapon of any kind. I mean, I guess you could like smash a mirror on someone's head, but, um, but I also have a, a fascination of like weapons that aren't weapons. You know what I mean? So like the fact that her talisman was a mirror instead of like a staff or a sword, I was like, oh, yes, 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 yes. She hits like all the tropes that I like to put together. So I love her. I absolutely love her. Um, and she continues and she continues in, in this season in Crystal to not get a huge amount of development compared to Pluto and Uranus, which is fine with me. I love that for her. Um, <laughs> we get a little more in the Eternal movies, but we'll talk about that next week. But yeah, um, Sailor Uranus, favorite thing, definitely a, um, a favorite of the Sailor Guardians for me. Yeah. So Landon, for this season, uh, what was your favorite thing? So I will be honest. There were a couple of things that were my favorite thing that we're going to go in more in depth. So lots of things were my favorite things. But the thing that like is easy to just talk about in a two minute section is Chibiusa. Uh, I have always loved Chibiusa. As you remember, Dark Lady was my favorite last time. Uh, And this time it's just such a fun comparison to see her be able to be a child. Like she has embraced this this idea that she has finished her mission that she has like that she she is now doing what she was supposed to do she's accepted uh Momoru and Usagi as as like family figures and now she gets to just be a kid even though she wants to be adult she gets to sit here and just enjoy childhood and because of that she's awesome (laughs) <laughs> yes, I love it. And I and I love that like one of the first things that we get of her in this season is um is her going to the fair with like Mamoru chaperoning her and her friends and it's just like it's very like Chibiusa saying like okay, um I am healed now. I am no longer, you know, so concerned about growing up and that's going to allow me to actually progress um in my aging the way that I should. Um, you know, yeah. full, full acceptance of her current state, her past state, and what will eventually come for her. There's like a metaphor of being like that she was so stuck in her own trauma because of everything that she had to be and had to like take on. And now that it's been taken off, she gets to be a kid. And I appreciate that. <laughs> yes, exactly. <laughs> Temporarily transformed into Sailor Chibusa version two. Exactly. Yes. Yes. Mm-hmm. And also her aesthetic is like my favorite thing. It's all roses and pink and cute and uh I just love it I love it it's true it's true she um you know I say Michu has the best color palette but like if I were to design a sailor guardian I would design something like Chibiusa like it would just be pink 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 I mean y'all (laughs) y'all I'm obsessed with Disney Dreamlight Valley right now and my character is like pink 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 with pigtails I mean like so this is what I do (laughs) <laughs> when it's time for this, me to design <laughs> this background of like vines crawling over the moon with like a purple pink galaxy with like little sparkly stars this is everything I want to embrace as a woman this is everything mm-hmm. I love <laughs> mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yes. So, yes yes the, uh, the, so the femme extreme <laughs> what you're here what you're hearing is that girls just either want to be green or pink or both yeah. Yeah, and that's I mean, it. we can be both. Mm-hmm. <laughs> it's true. Girls want to be pink. That's One absolutely thing. true. <laughs> All right. Uh, but for those of you who it's been a little while since you've watched uh, Sailor Moon Crystal or read the original manga or anything like that, Let's get into all the things that happened. So because this is anime, Karen will be telling us what happened in season three. Yes. Okay. Karen, plot synopsis time. Let's go. All right. Season three. The Sailor Guardians become more suspicious of a newly opened Mugen Academy. Monsters seem to be coming from there. However, so are some new faces. They meet Haruka, the famous race car driver, 
Michiru, the famous violinist, and Hotaru, a sad cyborg girl. Usagi befriends Haruka, Mamoru befriends Michiru, and Chibiusa befriends Hotaru. Also, Setsuna is back as a lab assistant at the academy, so she's been reborn too. Yay, everyone's here. Um, in this season, the Guardians face the Death Busters. They're a coven of witches led by Master Pharaoh 90, whose goal is to use the Tyron Crystal, his version of the legendary silver crystal, to recreate Earth in the image of his destroyed homeworld, the Tau Star System. He does this by possessing the bodies of various Japanese citizens like you do in Sailor Moon. Um, both the inner and outer guardians are fighting the Death Busters, and Sailor Moon wants everyone to work together, but the outer guardians believe that their mission to stop the destruction of the planet via Sailor Saturn um, is one that they should do without the inner guardians. They know this because they each have magical talismans you can see here in the photo that we've got. Meanwhile, we find out Hotaru will one day become Sailor Saturn and is being tortured by her father. She should have died in childhood, but Dr. Tomoe is a fanatical genetic researcher who is keeping her alive artificially. Oh, and by the way, he created the Death Busters through his grotesque experiments. Well, eventually, Sailor Saturn does awaken, but also Sailor Moon was right. As they And they should work together. She becomes Super Sailor Moon, and they use the power of friendship to band together, and then Sailor Saturn destroys Master Pharaoh 90 instead of destroying the whole planet as prophesized. But don't worry, she gets reborn as a baby, and Haruka, Michiru, and Setsuna go off to co-parent baby Hotaru together. Everyone else relaxes and begins preparing for Chibiusa to return to the future, now a fully matured guardian in her own right. The end. That is the season. It's a good season. Yes, yes, yes. We're going to talk about Mistress Nine. Yes, we're going to talk about Mistress Nine, my friend. Don't oh. you worry. I love this season. I love everything about it. It's just fantastic. The Mistress Nine. Yes. <laughs> All righty. Well, okay. then, now that we kind of know what's going on, let's get into it. Some things changed this season. And the big thing is the structure of the show changed quite a bit. And I think it was yeah. really noticeable. Uh, the thing that we noticed most of all is that this went from being an ensemble cast where the main characters was Usagi, but really that her girls were kind of as equally important to really just being a show about Usagi, Mamoru, and Shibiusa. Mm -hmm. uh, and the Sailor Scouts stepped into the background. Yes. I do think, especially because we've got the Outer Guardians being introduced here, we don't get nearly as much screen time for the girls. Um, the inner senshi only get character moments here and there. Now, we still have the structure of like each of the villains matches each of the girls and they go and they have their one-on-one -on -one showdown with their villain and they get like a little character moment through that. Like that still happens. So I don't want to say that like there is no character development at all for the inner senshi, but we have it even more extreme in this season that they get those moments in the beginning when they're, they're doing like the initial battles and then they kind of get like absolutely fucking nothing after that. Like really nothing happens for any of the girls after they do like their battles with their individual witches. Um, it's it's hard to find. It's hard to find moments for the, the four other girls after that. Yeah, they just. And it's interesting because so much of the plot kind of has to do with and we'll talk about like the uneasiness of the inner circle and the and the outer planets that come along later but because of this like lack of development it it loses a little bit of its spark in my mm -hmm. eyes uh part of what I loved about the magical girl show was the magical girls and while they are certainly there um it's it's not what it used to be it's not nearly as like 
we're a girl group and we're going to go fight. Uh, and I'm just noticing that every season we're meeting more and more scouts, which is a great thing, especially because you want all the planets represented. But it's also really hard because that means less and less time. And it gets crowded, right? It gets, it gets really crowded. crowded. Mm-hmm. And, and especially if you are introducing interesting and dynamic characters and you don't have, and you're not keeping up with the characters that you already had existed, it makes it really hard to feel connected to them. Mm-hmm. So mm-hmm. while I love Mitru and Horatel, Hor- 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 wow, I cannot Haruka. say the names. Haruka. Haruka. Thank you. Uh, um, I loved them. I loved learning about them. They're some of the best characters, uh, in my, in my opinion, in the show. All of a sudden, we lost on like Ray's coolness because there was another cool character that came in that had a really interesting story, mm-hmm. and that made me sad. <laughs> yeah, yeah, and it's true. It's true. I, I feel like there was not really a lot of effort put in, and and it's because they have to spend time figuring out. Um, the new characters that they've introduced. We have to spend time with Haruka and Michiru and Hotaru. Um, you know, so we have to we have to spend time with those characters to get to know them because we really don't know them at all. And that means there's less screen time for the girls. And um, and I do think that that's the right thing to cut. I don't think it would be right if we cut, you know, Amaru and, and Usagi and Shibuya's relationship, you know, inter- um, that's going on between them. Like cutting the girls is the right thing, but I wish instead we just didn't cut them and had another maybe episode or two uh, added in so we could get a little bit more screen time for the inner guardians. I think this is also where I'm feeling, um like my preference in TV shows too was especially relevant in this season because when you have hour-long episodes and 25 episodes per season you have so much time to fill that ensemble casts are a lot easier to manage um and I'm so like that's the media I'm used to consuming as a non-weeb or a weeb in training as Karen (laughs) likes to think it is (laughs) Someday, um, we'll, someday we'll make you a weave, Landon. <laughs> geez, this is the fourth time she said that today. So there was a conversation before this. Um, no, but I think uh, I think that that's like where I really struggled because I was like, man, if they just had longer episodes, we'd be able to see this. Or it would be like these moments where uh, the scouts were meeting together without like Usagi or Mamoru or anyone there those can last longer or we can see those interactions and understand those relationships a little bit more in depth uh Mm -hmm. and we we don't and Mm -hmm. I I think that this probably started last season but it's certainly much more relevant this season yeah absolutely absolutely um see how you like it when you become an otaku princessy lantern someday (laughs) well I don't know what that is princessy (laughs) Now I'm scared. <laughs> <laughs> don't be scared. Don't be scared. But yeah, absolutely. I think like, and, and we kind of have to, right? Because in the previous season, we had to make room for Chibiusa, right? But Chibiusa is one character. And now we've got three characters that we've never met. Um, you know, we don't have to spend too much time on Setsuna because we we met her before, you know, she was a side character in the previous season. We've got three brand new characters that we have never met as opposed to like one new main character that we've never met so there just there just isn't time like once we get past those initial episodes where each of the girls gets their own episode like there's really nothing there's really nothing because we're developing we're spending a lot of time developing the three new characters I think also this is where a huge uh issue not issue but this is also like where it kind of is unfortunate that they develop brand new villains with brand new ties to the world every single season because so much of that time is also dedicated to understanding who the villains are introducing these villains letting the audience in on things and and kind of like having to having to take that time like that's more time away from the scouts right and while it's interesting and we like it and we here enjoy a good villain uh it's it's like like obviously there wasn't a better choice to make you were right that it was the best choice but that's I think where also some of the time went yeah yeah so I think like there there's a couple of um things in regards to this that cause it to be a change for the worse 
right? So there's 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 a couple things in this particular season. Like we love it, favorite season, okay? Like don't get me wrong, but there's two things that happen in this season that I really dislike. The first one is the discourse among the scouts where you have the inner and the outer scouts like fighting each other, okay? Mm-hmm. And the truth is, there's not a version of Sailor Moon that I've seen where I actually like this plot point. So I think it's just like this plot point overall I have a problem with. (laughs) Because guess what? I don't like it in Crystal either. Didn't like it in the 90s anime. Didn't like it in the manga. Didn't like it in the, um, the live action like play versions. You know, I've just I've never seen this done in a way that I actually like. And, um, even though we have a lot of shortened, runtime, you know, in this, like we, we, we feel like it's quite condensed in, in everything that they're trying to pack in. I still feel like their fight, their fighting is pretty repetitive, isn't it? It like, it kind of just goes on and on for nothing, yes. you know? And that's why I wrote in my summary that's like, they know this because they each have magical talismans. Like still in this version, the, the three outer guardians are like, we can't work with you because reasons. And that's it. And, and Sailor Moon's like, but we have to. It's a magical girl show. The fuck? Like, don't you know what we're doing here? And they're like, yeah, but no, bye. And it, this this conversation happens like four, four times. Yes. Oh, my God. Four times. I think that that's something that the original did really well because the original had an arc of each of the uh outer sailors having to find their talismans of not knowing where the talismans were and it discovering that it's like a magical power within them so you know sailor uranus ended up getting one uh sailor sailor neptune ended up the mirror came out of her like and that at least added dynamics so that there was like actual reasons for them to be fighting right like that was like oh our mission is to literally find these talismans i don't care about stopping the world i don't care about you i care about finding these talismans because that's our mission and that like at least set up for possible opposition on this it literally is just like yeah we're fighting because we want to (laughs) fight yeah and i guess that's one of those things and we (laughs) talked about this a little bit in season one that um when you've got this tighter version where it is a lot more true to the manga you kind of start to think like oh you know filler episodes actually had a purpose and maybe some of them were like a good thing and I think that comes up again in this particular plot point for sure now I don't think there's any fixing it because like I said even in the 90s anime like I didn't like this plot point but it is it does make a little bit more sense like you're not wrong when you say that because they have to go on the quest to find the talismans first that it gives a little bit more meat when they get to the point of like you know finally coming together when after they fought between the inner and outer guardians all this time but still um i just think like it's just it's just silly it's just silly and it goes yeah. on and on and on i I will admit that this has all the tropes that I would particularly enjoy. I think that there's a lot of cool dynamics that could have been at play with inner and outer scouts fighting. Uh, But because the inner scouts, they dropped the ball on developing those and the outer scouts had to be like developed over time without any function of why they're in oppositional sides. Yeah. That is like what dropped the ball for me. No, Uh, I think you're right. In the 90s version, I liked it a little bit more because it did have that opposite oppositional. Those filler episodes were able to focus on the Sailor Scouts. Like there was a little bit more reasoning behind it and I enjoyed it. Uh, But right now it literally is like, oh, and they're fighting again. And they're talking about how they can't work together. And Sailor Moon wants to work together. And the Outer Scouts (laughs) are just saying no. And I don't understand why. (laughs) Yeah, it feels silly. And I and I think you're right. Something that would have made it a little bit easier to swallow is if they had spent time developing the relationships between them. Because we get a lot between like Mamoru and Michiru, right? Like we get a lot between Haruka and Usagi, right? We get a lot between Shibusa and Hutaru. But um, as far as the, the four girls, like they don't interact with Haruka or Michiru or Hotaru really at all. No. Nope. Or Setsuna even. Like they really don't interact. And they could have, they could have, they could have absolutely. I think there's I, a, I think there's an interesting connection between like Makoto and Haruka. Like I've got their, you know, their fight on here. I think there's interesting connections between like Setsuna and um, and Ray. You know, mm-hmm. some there, there's an interesting connection between Minako and uh, Amitru. I think like these characters have a lot in common, and yet they don't interact. It's, 
it's an interesting it's an interesting um thing like thought experiment to be like I feel like this season would have succeeded more if it had been 15 episodes instead of 12. Yeah. Yeah. Because even those three episodes could have introduced the idea of finding of them having to find talismans. It could have introduced a little bit more like of those connections being revealed a little bit more of the ability to like mix the sailor scouts outside of battle. Yeah. Uh, And that, that would have really, I think been a success for the story arc in total. Uh, this season felt slowest and also most rushed out of all of them. Yeah. It was it's an interesting yeah. combination. <laughs> yeah, very interesting combination. <laughs> yes, for sure. And then there's one other thing that we really dislike about this season. Now, this comes with a caveat. Okay, I'm not talking about Dr. Tomoe. Okay, he gets his mm-hmm. own. He gets his own section. Okay, we're gonna go into him yeah. later. He's a king. Yes. Amazing. No notes. Beautiful. Crystal is the best version of him. Anyway, we're going to talk about that more. But what we're going to talk about right now is all the other fucking villains. <laughs> um, we get an, an an eldritch horror shadow monster again who wants to destroy Earth again with um, villains that match each of the Sailor Scouts again with a ringleader lady that looks like an old woman, but not like old, old, just like middle aged old again. And the yeah. problem is that she has no connection to them. The way the previous ones did, like Beryl. Beryl was Endymion's um, ex-lover or like wished she could have been his lover or, you know, depending on what version you watch, it's something like that, right? Um, You know, and uh, and, and then we've got the the previous... Uh, lady is is somebody who um, has ties to the the kingdom, right? But this this lady is literally just like an evil scientist. That's it. That's all she is. And she even like I'm like she even looks like Beryl. Like that's the other thing yes. that like just I'm just like wow they reuse the animation and the character for Beryl without giving her any entire commitment to it. Um, I I I yeah I think again this is where we lose the filler because if I remember correctly from like the 90s. Like she at least, and we'll go into the her relationship with Dr. Tamoy, uh, mostly because there's a lot of changes. Um, but she at least like was an integral part of the manipulation of him, of his evil plans, of like being involved. And she is kinda in this one. But yeah, there's no emotional connection. She just is, she's just there. The villains are just yep. there, especially after coming off such a high season two villains where we were like, these villains are awesome. And the re- chemistry between Usagi and the villains are great. And they tie into the story. And then these are the villains were presented. It's like, mm-hmm. yeah, the princes, the princes <laughs> and black lady, mwah, chef's kiss, like chef's top kiss. tier Sailor Moon villains. And then we have this. It's like, okay. <laughs> yeah. And while Pharaoh 90, I think, is an interesting villain, it is just another eldritch horror mm-hmm. wanting to see the world destroyed. And yeah. I think that when you have two seasons of the same thing, it's a lot more forgiving because the first one was obviously successful. For, so the second one like, will be successful as well. It, but it's like the rules of three, right? Of that third one is not nearly as funny as that second one and the third one is not nearly as passing as it is as the other two yep we want to see something different it doesn't bother me that season two is a is a repeat of the eldritch horror shadow monster who wants to destroy the world because we have black lady Mm -hmm. and we have um you know and and i love manipulated mamaru you know and so and we have him again you know and so it's like it's okay but then we see this again and it's like Oh my God, can you do something different, please? Well, like, that's, that's even like, that's, and I will get to Haruto, Haruto in a second, but even that is like the Black Lady plotline of a woman grown up and a woman not in charge of her own body and stuff like that is replayed in this season. And it's like, please come up with something new. Yeah. <laughs> you, like yeah. if you're not going to build on what you've developed and you're not going to take it to the next level, because honestly, I don't think at this point you can, you need to do something completely different so that we're not just like being like, I just watched the season. Yeah. It, it's the same thing that's happened. Yeah. Yep. The villains this, this season, although my favorite season has the weakest villains. Um, They're, they're repetitive and they're boring. Like that's just the truth. They just are. Um, Sorry, not sorry, but it's true. And I think that like this goes to show like how much we really put weight 
into the characters because this is our favorite season like for both of us and we hate the things that are driving us forward we dislike <laughs> a huge conflict which is the inner and outer discourse between the scouts and we dislike the big conflict which is the villain right like we still love this season regardless of the lack of conflict or the regardless of the lack of like immediate conflict Exactly. Oh my gosh. Hey, welcome Sailor Garnet. So um, for those of you guys that don't know, we've rated Sailor Garnet a couple of times. They're also playing Final Fantasy X. So in a lot of my Final Fantasy X streams, I will go raid them. Um, thank you so much for joining us today, Sailor Garnet. Guess what we're talking about? Sailor Moon. I know you love Sailor Moon as well. Uh, they are great. You should go, you should go follow them. Um, we'll, in the, in, when the middle, when we have a little ad break, we'll do a shout out for Sailor Garnet and y'all should go follow all of them. Um, I just don't want the clip to play quite right now. We're going to do that later. But yeah, um, I feel like for this particular season, it's even though it's my favorite one, it's got some problems. Um, and and it's really it's really these two things. Like, honestly, everything else about the season is excellent, top tier, wonderful. But this the, the conflict of it, uh, mm, uh, <laughs> weak. Yeah, it's weak. Weak. It's weak. Yeah. Uh, so, but... There were some changes that were for the good. Oh my gosh. Okay. Time to gush. All right. <laughs> this Time is to my gush. Oh gosh. All of you people that complained. Um, talking about are we talking about Cosmos? We will be. We will be when it comes out in 2023. Mm -hmm. We will be when it comes out in 2023. We're talking about season three right now. This is the uh, Sailor Saturn season. Okay. Changes for the better. This season. Oh, mm, the animation, gorgeous, beautiful. The transformation sequences, like I put, I put a shot of Venus's transformation sequence, and you see all this beautiful glowing, these beautiful flowing lines. This um, like the the hair everywhere, which is a huge visual part of Sailor Moon. You got to have way too much hair, more hair that can possibly grow out of a head, even if you put in extensions. Okay, these girls like they're just hair everywhere. Okay, glowing everywhere, Prince. beautiful the roses everywhere. The transformations brought me back to when I was in like elementary school and I was pretending to transform into a yes. Sailor Scout. Like I was like, oh. this is the magic I've been waiting for. Prior to this, I was just like, why am I watching a 30 second clip of someone like dancing around? It is kind of beautiful. But this one, oh, stunning, stunning. stunning. Oh my God. And it's true. And this really shows that like what a good transformation sequence can do for a magical girl show. Cause you're right. Like the animation in season one, garbage we hate it like we talked about that a couple episodes ago you guys can go back on my youtube and find it and watch it season two it's better like i really believe the animation is good in season two but in season three it is excellent it's excellent i mean just like look at this shot of sailor moon that we've that i've got on the right and you can see like how that how that ribbon is like impossibly big and beautifully flowing how much hair is coming out of those buns um you know and then she's got like this beautiful she's like so beautiful against the black background it's just it the look of season three is gorgeous if i swear if they would have put this much effort into the animation starting in season one there would not have been so much hate and controversy mm -hmm. for sailor moon crystal the way that it came out like if they had had this level people people would be raving today still about how amazing of a reboot sailor moon crystal was i swear i swear because people got distracted by the bad animation even though there's a lot of good stuff in season one um but season three ah oh, beautiful just so gorgeous so good yeah. um no it's, it was interesting because again i am a i am a not a weeb we've been training to some and uh I never connected to cartoons. I didn't grow up watching cartoons. So like the idea of animation shows has never really held my attention. When I start to notice the animation, that's how you know the animation is good. And so like, I remember this scene with Sailor Moon that we have on the right. And it just being like this moment of like her looking into the darkness and her like contemplating and just being like, wow, this is actually visually like, important and I feel it and I see it and I noticed it uh and that's like how I knew I was like the animation is above and beyond uh because I I am taking it in and I am actually watching love that yes for sure and animation can do things that 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 live action can't and whenever yeah. that medium is leaned into it, it just it makes it, it elevates the material so 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 much 
it's art it's artwork like you have the opportunity to tell a story by by putting images exactly how you want them to be and everything is purposeful and when you know that the artist did that for that reason it, it can be incredibly impactful and beautiful um and it's this season was fantastic with that it was full of it so good thank you so much for the uh tier one sub Sailor Garnet, by the way, yes, please enjoy those emotes. Also, every time we get a sub, we put a pin on the pin curtain. So um, we'll do that towards probably the end of stream. We'll do that as part of the outro today. Um, but it wasn't just the animation. There is other production values that were stepped up in this season too. The music, oh yes. my God, the intro and outro songs and the different ones that they have, as well as the background and ambient music. Oh my God, it's so good. Like I the wish- playlist? slaps it slaps it totally so slaps good. it totally slaps uh, oh my god and it's so good tone so well mm -hmm. like mm -hmm. uh like that is something that i just remember being very impacted by when i watched the 90s versions especially the movie oh yeah the like the jazz riffs like, in the 90s versions are yeah, so good <laughs> jazz riffs or just like the the climax song like oh mm -hmm. that it's like oh the world is ending and we have to do this thing and it was like beautiful lyrics in japanese and it was beautiful music in the background and you could just 100 percent understand that like this was the moment and we were missing it. Like I wasn't connecting to the music so much in this in this show. And I didn't realize how much I was missing those moments until the music production on this show, so much better. Yeah. Uh, the, the playlist slaps. <laughs> It was so good. And I we were talking um earlier about how, you know, I was because I was really into music when I was a kid. Right. Um, and I kind of wish I had continued to study that so I could like in a technical sense explain to you why this music is so much better. Um, but I, I don't I don't have that knowledge. I did not continue that study. So all I can really tell you is like this music makes my heart swell in a way that the season one and two did not like I can listen to a song from season three and instantly be in Sailor Moon mode in my mind. And and the season one and two music does not do that for me. I mean, it's it's fine, but it's not great. <laughs> it's very video game like background music. Like I was listening to it and I was like, man, this would be great background music for a D, &D combat. Like that mm. was so much how it's it's very video game-esque sort of stuff. It I think it just enhanced and it it really Instead of it being like something in the background to fill the silence, I think that they really found ways to integrate it into the tone and the point that they were making. Yes, exactly, Garnet. It gives big Final Fantasy vibes. Big Final yes. Fantasy vibes. Yes. Um, in addition to the music, another thing about this season that is really, really good is Osagi and uh, Mamoru's relationship. There is a subplot where... Um, uh, Usagi becomes involved with Haruka. There's a kiss, iconic, absolutely iconic kiss, as we know from every version. It's beautiful. Um, and then also, we don't see this as much on screen, but we know that it's happening because we are shown bits and pieces of it. Mamoru is kind of having the same thing going on with Michiru, right? And uh, and the the jealousy between them is so palpable that Chibiusa can't even keep her mouth shut about it, and she's like, "Why are you guys fighting?" <laughs> Um, but I love that their relationship has come so far that they're both able to acknowledge, yeah, we're kind of being jealous butts right now and we're doing things that maybe we shouldn't be doing and, um, and let's actually try to talk about it. And, and they both reaffirm that like, even though these things happened and even though they have regrets about how they act towards each other in this season, they still love each other and they still want to continue the partnership and it's just this like really beautiful moment that almost makes you forget that these characters are still teenagers. <laughs> yeah, I think it is beautiful. And and we'll talk about this a lot actually next episode of their like plot arc of their relationship. But this is like really where we start to see like they know that they're going to get married. They know that they're going to have a kid. They've kind of been playing big one happy family sort of thing. But like this is like actual adult relationships which is so fun to see on screen because so much of the time our media is inundated with really toxic dynamics between people who are in love uh even if they're geared at kids and it's hard to like 
recognize that that does have an impact, but it does. And so being able to sit there and actually have healthy examples of like communication of being like, Hey, I'm sorry that like I crossed a line and I still love you and I still choose you. And I will be more careful in the, in the future to make sure that that line doesn't get crossed is an incredibly healthy way to like communicate with a partner. (laughs) Yes, it really is. Um, yes, exactly. Uh, Sailor Moon does enforce a lot of emotional maturity. Mm-hmm. Um, yes, 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 yes. The 90s anime actually does this really well, too. And I feel like this season is like a good a good glimpse of it. But yeah, we've, we're going to have a whole section um, next week where we talk about uh, Mamoru and Osagi's relationship because next week we're going to be talking about Eternal. And lots more fun stuff happens in their relationship then. But yeah, even in this season, like you get these little glimpses of it where they are they have truly like grown into a real partnership like you do not have usagi without mamoru you do not have mamoru without usagi they are together they are navigating this world together and they plan to continue navigating this world together and that is very very clear and open well it's just it's so it's so nice too to see like cuz i don't even remember I'm not going to lie. I don't even remember the Haruku and Usagi's kiss from the 90s. Um, I only remember uh, Michu and Mamoru's uh, relationship developing and Usagi's jealousy over it. So it was also really nice to see, like, to have to come from such a season that Usagi was so in, like, in her own jealousy and in her own feels and obsessiveness to come to this and to just be, like, lay it on the table and see how she's grown up as a character that was so cool. It was really cool. And it was a really subtle way of doing it. Yep. And I want to just take a second to acknowledge that I also love the problematic toxic relationships. Like this is not like a take down of those types of relationships either. It is just really nice to see something focused on high schoolers that does have their main relationship be healthy. Cause I do feel like that doesn't always happen. And, um, and sometimes, especially in these long running shows, when you have the, the toxic back and forth type of relationship, it can become, at least me as an audience, sometimes I start to be tired. Sometimes I start to think like, okay, just like break up or fix it already. I'm bored. But (laughs) Sailor Moon only lets you have one season of the toxic craziness. So you never get, you never feel that moment, which is very refreshing. Yes. I forget that people don't know that I am the human embodiment of (laughs) a lack of morality and depravity when it comes to dark and terrible ships and toxicity i loved it it's my favorite thing i will not stop talking about house of dragon right now and it's really annoying every one of my friends because of this uh (laughs) but dear lord uh toxicity is awesome in shows in dynamics especially when it's used to grow characters but it is it's a nice it's a breath of fresh air it's like a it's like a palate cleanser um especially if we're like in a in a wholesome tv show like that's the other thing too is that this tv show is the purpose of this tv show is wholesome at the end of the day it's a love story that is supposed to be about the power of friendship and the power of love uh we're not supposed to like find the depravity in any of these dynamics uh because yes. it's a kid show and that does have a different like area in the back of my brain for it yes oh my gosh vulnerable moments regardless of gender garnet you have to come next week when we talk about eternal you've got to come next week when we talk you about do. eternal okay you do. <laughs> yes absolutely so there's a lot about this season that is that is different um from the previous two seasons that is good too. I know we did a lot of complaining about the villains, but there's there there are reasons, the, and these are them. Um, it's our favorite that, show. It's our favorite yeah that season. we love this season. These story arcs are wonderful and awesome, and we'll like we haven't even started talking about the themes that are really impactful. Um, but also, I think that we should mention that a huge reason why it's our favorite season is because Haruku and uh, Michiru is are amazing. <laughs> They're fantastic because is gay. He's gay. He's gay. Uh, and that's what I meant to say is that this is the gayest season of Sailor Moon. And if you don't the, think Sailor the, Moon is gay, you're wrong. It's Sailor the gayest Moon. season of the gayest rendition of Sailor Moon. And it and here's the here's the catch, folks. It only gets queerer from here. Oh, I need that gift. If someone <laughs> saying that, that just needs to be a gift that I need for the rest of my life. 
It only gets uh, queerer from here. It yeah. only gets queerer from here. Yeah, uh, so gay, so <laughs> lovely. Uh, and just uh, such a relief to like not have to pretend that they're cousins with an immense <laughs> amount of sexual attraction to each other. Oh my god. Oh my god. Okay, well, well, okay, okay. We're we're getting ahead of ourselves. We're getting ahead of ourselves. Let's Are let's we? do a quick let's do a quick little sponsor break. Okay. Sponsor break time. So before we get to the themes, you guys. <laughs> themes. All right. All right. A word from our sponsor. Uh as always. Here on uh, Enter Stage Wimbo, we have Audible, uh, who is a wonderful read aloud books uh, website run through Amazon. It's audibletrial.com slash Enter Stage Window. If you sign up, you get a free audiobook and you get to support our show. Uh, and uh, you should definitely do that. It's audibletrial.com slash Enter Stage Window. I love Audible. I use it myself as somebody who really struggles to actually read the written word um, as an adult. I'm just, I'm busy. Okay. I'm busy. I got things to do. I got a job. I got a stream to run. I got a husband. I got animals. I got lots, lots of life, lots of life going on. So, um, I like to listen to audiobooks, and you get a free trial. And if you, um, sign up through that link, then, uh, we get a little, we get a little kickback from audible. So you should definitely do that. Yes. All right. This week's book recommended is, let's see if it'll actually appear on there. Hello. Cer- Maybe. Yes, we can it's see it. Cersei. Cer- it's Cersei. Oh, Cersei. Okay. By uh, Madeline Miller. And I've suggested Madeline Miller on the show before. Mm-hmm. Uh, but this was one of my summer reads this summer. And it is fantastic. It's a retelling of the Greek story of Cersei, the, we- the witch, uh, who was the daughter of Helios and was exiled to the island where she meets Odysseus and Perclus and Icarus and all of these insane Greek god heroes and how she like has interactions with them and she's just a wild witch woman who uh is kind of develops to be a badass and I I feel like that is just the feminine the ultimate feminine story uh and it is fantastic and great and if you love Greek mythology like I do and like an entire millennial generation does you'll really love this story. So it's great. And the audio, uh, the person who does the audiobook has just such a soothing voice. It's very oh. witchy. It's so good. Oh, I love that. I love that. Ah, uh, I'll have to pick it up. That definitely sounds like up my alley. <laughs> I think you would really like it. I mean, it sounds like, it sounds like, like, um, girl boss and witches and smooth voice. Yes. I mean, you said like all of my favorite things. <laughs> it's, it's just a great story about a young woman who, uh, questions, why the world is the way that she is and then is punished mm. for it and finds a way to find exist within it anyway so it's oh, that's always that. fun uh, okay so beautiful story retellings i like i like to talk about the retellings during the reboots episodes so yes and we love we love a good um greek myth retold from the woman's perspective i'm just such a greek myth slut <laughs> I all right you guys let's <laughs> let's do a quick shout out for sailor garnet y'all should yes. all go follow her let's see what clip it pulls isn't it the sending oh, takes them to the does that help with allergies rest in peace because i feel like so it would just mysterious. make me cry hmm. you cooking dinner that's good what are you making <laughs> oh hold on forgot to do the god this is also a thank you stream Oh my gosh. Oh, your cosplay looks so cute though. So uh, for so you don't I, I know you probably don't know Sailor Garnet. Landon can't hear the clips, but um but it was yes. it was a funny clip. <laughs> she can always, only see them. <laughs> it's always my favorite when uh when Karen is like, let's take it away to the clip. And then I'm just sitting here awkwardly in my own side. <laughs> Poor Landon. We'll have to figure uh, out some way so that you can hear the no. clips in the future. <laughs> but what I do is I go back and I rewatch them later because I'm always curious about the people that we shout out here because we have a lovely community and I'm very excited to meet more Twitch people. Yes, yes, absolutely. Okay. All right. Let's talk about the themes. <sighs> Let's talk about the themes. themes. Body, yadi, yadi, yadi. <laughs> <laughs> Listen, number one theme of uh, this season is bodies, 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 bodies. And uh, what that means, gender and sexuality, as well as uh, 
permission and autonomy over your own body. It has it all. And it's amazing because all of these themes existed in the original 90s as well. So to know that this is a conversation and a theme that has existed through the manga, through all the versions of Sailor Moon, love it. Yes. And this um, crystal, crystal goes ham on this theme. They're like, you know, it's, um, I guess this was 2015 or 2016 when season three came out. They were like, you know, it's, it's 2016. Let's go. Let's go. This is what Naoko Takuchi would have written if she could have been as queer as she wanted to be. Okay. And they go hard. And so this season is all about bodies. So the first part of that is, of course, Haruka, Sailor Uranus. Okay. And this this season is so good because not only um, do they keep all of the stuff from the original manga about how she relates to her womanhood, but they literally state it over and over. She states it. Um, Michiru <sighs> states it. Okay. And it is so clear. Like they're literally like, she is gender fluid. <laughs> she is a man and a woman. And when you couple this, yeah, when you couple this with um, the interview from, oh gosh, this was forever ago. And this was actually in relation to the, the sailors talking about the sailor starlights. But Nako is famously quoted as saying, only women can be sailor soldiers, right? So what that means is that any woman, okay, any woman can be a sailor guardian. It does not matter how gay you are. It does not matter if you're gender fluid or non-binary. Any woman, any woman, period. If you, if you relate to the idea and aspect of womanhood, you can be a sailor scout. Yes. Like, and that's amazing. That's, <laughs> oh, so and good. It's, so, it's so nice to see it like, blatantly represented that there is like a line where sh she goes why why does it matter yeah why, why do does you it care matter? why do you care yeah. and like like just at, just being able to hear that question be asked and answered in that way it not only is so gay but it's just so simple because that's the answer right yeah like that's why does, why does her curiosity, uh, why does she feel that it, that uh, Sailor Saturn owns her, or she, not Saturn, sorry, Uranus, owe her a response? Yeah, exactly. She doesn't. And if she doesn't, she doesn't. And, you know, Usagi is obviously bi anyway. You know, she gets a crush on every single one of her friends, um, you know, regardless of her her relationship with Mamoru. Um, and yes, big Aquarius Aaron energy in this character. I totally agree congress should just watch sailor moon ah! <laughs> it should it's so simple you're right it's so simple it's so simple and i think that um you know of course usagi is going to be incredibly attracted to haruka um because like she, she you know bisexual that? queen bisexual queen so if, you know oh. she sees somebody this gender fluid and attractive and successful like how is she not going to have a little flirtation with them how right uh, and just like also who wouldn't I, mm. as every as a, as the representation of every queer woman currently because I have a platform and you're watching this uh, who wouldn't have a crush on her <laughs> she's hot uh, <laughs> but no and I think that like it also gives us amazing opportunity to be able to see her so presented so masculine while not being a sailor scout and then also being able to embrace femininity while being a sailor scout and like that's just there is a powerful story there and I'm so happy that it was not only originally written in the manga but then that we're able to compare it to the disaster that was the 90s American dubbed version of their cousins that she is a woman she's very clear that she's a woman um that there's how dare you like there's not even a question of it it is that she just is a she just likes to wear pants right yeah. like to be able to take that and to have something 30 years later remade to embrace all the things and all the changes that have happened and not even have it be a big thing 
it's a it's a throwaway line that if you skip ahead or you miss it, you blink, it doesn't actually change anything. Nope. And that like sometimes sometimes we get to see the change that has been made in the world in media. Uh, and this is a clear version and it's so, it, it, it just warms my little queer heart. Yep. Didn't even know what gay was at 13, but even I knew, right? Like no one, no one thought they were cousins. No one thought they were cousins. I was just very confused because I have cousins and I don't know why they look at each other that way. Cause I don't look at my cousins that way. <laughs> there just was so much tension. I'm very yeah. confused. <laughs> the nineties dub did Poor Haruka, so dirty, um, so, so dirty. But even in the original Japanese, it wasn't as overt, right, as it was yeah. in Crystal. And I think that there's a couple of things um, going on with that. Queerness is much more accepted in the U.S. as well as in Japan. And um, and I think that allowing queerness in children's media especially um, and we've seen a lot of this lately that there's there's queer representation particularly uh, sapphic representation in a lot of children's media recently and um, and streaming has a lot to do with it like we had talked about like well you know what why is yeah. that and it's like well you know what the kids don't watch tv on tv anymore they don't they watch it streaming and so it's just it's a little bit different because it's not like it's not like you turn on the TV and something just comes on when you're streaming. You you select what you want to watch and based on what you've watched and maybe an algorithm feeds you suggestions and things like that. It's a little bit different. So it kind of allows for a little bit more open representation of um, of queerness in, in gender and in sexuality, well, you know, in, allowed, in children's media. Yeah. So how it used to work in case, in case people don't remember, uh, how it used to work is that companies obviously would fund projects. So you would have the same amount of companies that would fund or buy the rights to projects and then stream them on channels. Uh, so they, as a company, would decide what was appropriate to put out, what aligned with their values, what was okay, what sort of stances they wanted to take. And then prior to being able to present that, they then had to go to the national, like, uh, basically a, a system that, that rated things mm -hmm. for TV. And then that national standards determined what rating levels that received. And then that national standard was actually in line with the government and their standards. So you could have a lot of censorship determined on different eras of, of political parties in that term too. Um, and so all of a sudden you had you, you had companies who were not only beholden to their own standards, but companies that were also beholden to the government because you didn't want to run something that was teen or R rating basically, or MA rating on a kid's show because you couldn't let that fly. So then all of a sudden you had to be beholden to what those standards were. Now that we have streaming, it doesn't fucking matter. <laughs> Det Companies I mean, get to oh. determine their own standards, their own rating system, because there isn't a national rating. Uh, even like, so like Netflix's adult rating is different than like what Hulu's is. Yeah. Now, to be clear, like this, this still happens. Companies still give shows notes and, yes. um, and creators are still asked to change things annoyingly um, that they don't want to change. It's like, so this still happens. It's not like gone, gone, but it's no. like way freaking better than it used to be. It exists within a company level yeah. rather than having a secondary yeah. company government yeah. informing that. So right. it is now the cover. It is now like the higher ups or an internal team that gets to decide that. Right. Um, like it's different. It's different. Yeah. So the censor, the censorship is not universal. Whereas before it was because mm -hmm. you had, you had one thing determining the censorship of every single TV show and broadcast. And yep. now you have a, as many streaming services determining the censorship. And so what HBO wants to censor is going to be different than what uh, Netflix censors. Yes. And that's why you're allowed to have such a variety. And that's why also like more representation is happening. Yeah. And uh and and we still have this for like movies that get released in theaters. We yeah. still have this for video games, right? Like there's the ESRB ratings for video games. There's a motion motion picture association of America for movies, but this doesn't exist nearly as much for TV, which is why you can find so much amazing beautiful queer stuff on TV. 
But it's also interesting because TV is the media that is put out the fastest. Yeah. Um, movies take years to make in pre-production, post-production, filming and editing, right? Mm -hmm. TVs take, like they're in American TV, they're every year can put out 24 episodes. Yeah, it's fast. Uh, and, and hell, every week can, can stream live or can stream something that was filmed earlier that day that then is put out right? Mm -hmm. Like it, there can be as almost immediate sort of responses, even with film and fiction. Mm -hmm. um, so it's, it, yeah, there's a lot, there's a lot more freedom. And that has seen the progression of what is allowed to be talked about. Uh, and, and because of an that, of and because of that, Haruka is able to come on and say, like, I am gender fluid, and you're just going to have to deal with that. And that means it's still okay for me to be a sailor guardian. Because any woman can be a sailor guardian. It does. My body is not what makes me a sailor guardian. It is me and my relation to my womanhood. Well, and I can also like struggle with wanting to be like whatever I am. Like I can also have days where I am like the concept of gender fluid in general with this. Like we will get into hypothetically when we talk about cosmos we'll get into more trans women but with this particular one it is like I am able to be whatever I want to be mm -hmm. uh, and that does not make me less woman it does not make me more woman it yeah. just makes me some way involved in womanhood whether mm -hmm. whether yeah and that's that's such a cool aspect <laughs> it really is it really is and it's like it, it's like that elevation that elevation from like the tomboy aesthetic into like okay, well, it's not just tomboys. Like it's, it's any, it's any woman. It's any woman. Yes. And it's, and it's anyone who identify like in, in like, yes, it's any woman, but it's also like a step up of it's anyone who identifies or can relate to womanhood because like non-binary people are not women, but they can relate and have relations to womanhood. They can still be sailor guardians too they can yeah. and and we're able to have these conversations and discussions and they're able to be throwaway lines yeah. in shows without it having to be a whole freaking queer coming out toe tipping sort of how are we going to present this for an audience that will understand there's just an assumption that an audience will understand and well aware that the audience is children yes exactly yeah i, I learned a lot about censorship because of anime as well. And I do, and I do love like the new, there's a lot about the current anime um, market and the way that it's produced that I don't like, but I do love that we don't really get a lot, get the censorship anymore. I do love that. We really do get what they're producing, which is really nice. It's, it is. It's really nice. Yep. So, but it's not just Haruka's body. body. Yaddy, yaddy. No. Yeah. It's not just Haruka's body. There's more bodies. There's more about bodies. Well, it's, yeah, because Haruku, like, it's this interesting thing because the theme is body, 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 adi, 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 but it is like Haruku gets to control and gets to determine her body and the relationship to it. And then we have Haruku who can't. Yes. Oh my gosh, poor little Saturn. Um, <laughs> uh, Hotaru, uh, she she doesn't have such a positive relationship with her body. Um, she gets no choice in what happens to her body over and over and over. Um, yeah. <laughs> she she is a very interesting case, and they don't really touch on this too much. But when you talk about the beginning of her story where she was supposed to pass away as a child, but due to Tomoe's um, experiments that he did on her, she ended up surviving. Um, and I and it, it's not really commented on exactly, but it definitely makes me think about the idea of we do not choose to be born into this world. And I think in Sailor Moon, that exists without being commented on too terribly much in the sense that the uh, Sailor Guardians keep getting reborn over and over and over again, right, in different eras and things like that so that they can do what they need to do. And um, this is the saddest example of that, where not only does she get reborn, but she has an opportunity to exit this situation. And apparently in the original timeline, she did, but because of Tomoe's meddling, this timeline that we're currently witnessing ends up different and she survives and she survives in a body that she is clearly unhappy with. She is in pain all the time, physically and emotionally. 
Um, I think that, it, you know, if, if we didn't have her do what she ends up doing by the end and we were to see like an adult Hotaru just live out her life, she would probably have very serious um, depression and anxiety develop as she aged because she clearly has the beginnings of it now as a kid. Um, poor thing. She is actually a cyborg. Yep. And uh, uh, it's very, very sad. Oh, and a quick interesting fact. If you didn't know, um, Sailor Mercury, Amy, was originally supposed to be a cyborg, and that got dropped. That particular plotline for her got dropped and got recycled back into Hotaru. So cyborgs is something that Naoko always wanted to write. It's interesting because, like, just to... We're, we're talking about a show that involves space and sat powers and technology, uh, however, has existed mostly in the fantasy realm of things. Uh, but the introduction of cyborg pushes it into sci-fi genre, and that's just a very interesting thing. Yeah. Uh, that's just really cool. But no, I think that there's this, like you were kind of saying, is that there's multi-levels here to the lack of autonomy she has with her own body. Uh, one being that Saturn, like through the season, like her being born is a bad omen to or her existing and living and coming and arriving is supposedly this bad omen of life and destruction uh and that like that itself means that she doesn't have like any autonomy in the living and existence of her life like she even talks about later in the season how uh she wasn't supposed to be born she wasn't supposed to be here because there isn't supposed to be this grand master of destruction. And like, that is what she represents. Uh, and that's like an interesting thing to be like born for only one purpose yeah. and like the commentary that exists there. And she doesn't, and it, it happens throughout the season too. Like she gets no choice. Even the moment that she decides that she might want to have a choice, what ends up happening to her is she gets possessed and, and by Mistress Nine, right? Like the moment that she's like, you know what? Actually, I, I think I'm going to try to take control. I think I'm going to try to have a real friend with Chibiusa. I think I'm like, I'm, I'm really going to try to do this life thing. It's like, nope, you're going to get possessed now. And you have to fight to even keep control of your own mind um, while your body has completely changed around you. Yeah. And so like, it's this, it's this sort of like, we see the repeat of the fast aging and everything like that with her and the, the, the uh, overtaking without permission of a young child's body to then be grown up and thrown into a villain position. Like that's a very repeat or very like alludes to the dark lady plot line, uh, except dark lady had a choice in it. Haruto did not. Yeah. She didn't get to choose that. She, it was overtaken without her permission. Yeah. Uh, and that's, it. it's just, it's interesting that like we've had these ideas of being taken without our, like the girls and being taken without their will of like having things pressed upon them that they haven't like consented to. But like, this is the first time that like we're really seeing the negative ramifications throughout an entire season of it yes um yeah yeah starting, absolutely starting at the very beginning when she she has this stuff happen to her body in order to preserve her survival that ultimately harms her yeah i mean ultimately oh kitty cat um there's a kitty cat in your background it's merlin <laughs> i was trying to i was like is that sherlock or merlin i couldn't no it was merlin. merlin yeah um and, and it's it's just so sad because she doesn't have this like oh i wish i could grow up oh i wish i could be yeah. healthy like no she her thoughts are really more like oh why am i in this body i wish i wish you know i i had not survived like that's more about the vibe that you get from her you get no it's not like chibiusa where you get the sense that she has any interest in growing up and growing old and having power like she doesn't she just wants to not be in pain anymore that's all she wants and what she ends up with is instead being forced to survive and grow up and be an adult and completely lose control of her body it's not like chibiusa where becoming dark lady was a moment of empowerment for her that helped her reconcile what it meant to grow up and what her place in the world was instead 
for Haruka, it was a moment to, or sorry, not Haruka, Haru, ha, Hotaru. Haru, their, Haru. their names are too They're similar. So named. Um, <laughs> so it was a moment for Hotaru to realize that, like, actually, it's not just my body, it's my mind that I'm concerned about too, and maybe I, I should fight for something. Um, but, uh, but she, she never fights for like her future. It's more about her trying to reconcile with this, these cards that she's been dealt of having this body constantly in pain. And it's also like, there's a level there too, of knowing that like the thing, the thing that caused, that is causing her pain was done to her to have her survive. But that survival and that sacrifice that Dr. Tom, 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 ah, I'm so Tomoe. bad at names. Tomoe, thank you. Uh, Tomoe um, did wasn't out of love. It wasn't, and then and we'll talk about that in a second, but it, it wasn't this like act of like, my baby is dying and I need to save her and I will do anything, including sacrificing her comfort for her. It was a experiment. And it was done without care and concern for her to provide a future of like an experiment. Yeah, she, it she was, was it was, it was just, her. he was just like, I think I could do this. Let me try. And that's all there yeah. was to it. And, and yeah, she's totally, I, and I think she's totally obsessed with death, even as, as Hotaru and as Sailor Saturn, of course, like um, Garnet, I see you talking a lot about like uh, death in regards to her. And I think that's like so accurate especially when she actually awakens as sailor saturn and um and she has these moments where you know for her causing silence and causing death is not a negative thing because think about how she's lived so far she's lived without any agency in her actions because she's been controlled by her father she's always had pain in her body she's always had weakness she's needed um, she's needed that the crystal, like the AIDS constantly. She's never, ever been able to just live as herself. So for her, death is a respite. Death is like, you know, going to bed at night. It's it's a nice thing. It's a kind thing. It's a thing you look forward to. So for Sailor Saturn, she can understand that like, you know, maybe um, visiting death upon this planet is not such a good thing. Now, we talked about, of course, in the in the summary that uh, Sailor Moon ends up basically changing her mind and she decides to destroy the villain instead of destroying the Earth. But her original mission was to destroy the Earth so that it could start over new and uh, and, and birth the new millennium. But, um, yeah, but she decides that. against it. Well, it's with that aspect of like what's really incredibly important to her character is that like it's not just death. She it's the death that leads to the rebirth. It's the fire yes. that can allow for regrowth, right? And because all the characters are living and existing in that world and everything like that, they don't necessarily want the end of that world. So it is so hyper focused on that death. Uh, that they forget about the rebirth but when she makes that final decision to like save things but like accepts herself as death she then gets to be reborn in a body that does not hurt mm -hmm. she gets mm -hmm. to have that rebirth for herself yep. um and and she might have been able to do that earlier too or she would have because she's a sailor scout so so at some point she would have been reborn because that's what they do but it's, it's an interesting, it, like, it's just an interesting tale because so much of the, like, death and rebirth is like a trope that is played out, but it's told in such a poetic way in this, in this version that it feels nice. It is really nice. It's nice that she, that she gets a chance to have a body that's not working against her. So she gets yeah. to go ahead and, and have a life with um with a body that's not going to be in pain anymore and yes exactly garnet with three amazing mommies um that are actually going to take care of her instead of use her for their own narcissistic plots and so she gets to have a body she can actually love and be comfortable with in the end she gets that she gets that autonomy but in order like she had to exist before it like she she still had to live with these this reality to make her who she is and that's 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 part of like yeah I like that that plays into that harshness of 
of the cold detached character she kind of has to play uh but it feeds the character really well in fact in my opinion out of all the characters developed Hotaru has always been the has always been the character that has made the most sense and feels the most thought out she gets the Um, most growth too she gets the most growth like um I'm so excited for next week for Sailor Moon Eternal because uh Hotaru gets even more development in that um and and I would say like if you look through all the characters aside from Usagi um Hotaru is the one that goes through the most change in throughout the entirety of like all the Sailor Moon arcs yeah and I think I think with Usagi is that her her level of change she like love her she's great but she's she she doesn't ever really I feel like go through anything that truly changes her she she doesn't start from a low place over time yeah yeah but there isn't there isn't she has never really been at rock bottom Mm -hmm. uh and so the amount of growth that she has done is is not as substantial as Hataru in my opinion uh it's so it, it is interesting to be able to like see the the vast difference of where this character started and where she's ending this season which is very similar place she is born again she's gonna be young and innocent very much how she started at the beginning of the season Mm -hmm. uh but she'll be able to actually do it right this time and maybe that means this time that the that the saturn that is going to be born won't be necessarily the way that she was when we saw her in this season yeah she Uh, won't feel compelled to end the whole planet (laughs) yeah that she can exist that both these things can exist that she can like have a just death and destruction and respect for it but also a love of life Mm -hmm. and wouldn't we all want that right wouldn't we we all want all would want that Yes, yeah, I mean, that sounds like that sounds like a, a very healthy place to be a, a good respect for death while also a good appreciation for life. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that's been it's, okay. I, she she those are the two favorite things like those two yeah. characters are my favorite so of, this, of this season. It's such a great story. Mm-hmm. All right. Shall we go into our next theme? Yes. So we promised you guys we would come back to Tomoe. So um he is really fucking evil <laughs> he it's, does it's, a, go ahead you know you're good you're good I was gonna say it's also important to like point out that this is this has been something that we wanted to talk to uh, talk about or at least I wanted to talk about a lot is like the fact that this this Sailor Moon didn't originate here in America it is a Japanese story uh, and that has a lot of influence. And Dr. Tome is where the pinnacle of that influence is. Yeah. Yep. Um, we're going to get into this in this slide and in the next, but there's a lot of World War II illusions going on here. So um, during World War II, a big uh, popular kind of thought at the time was um, was eugenics and cre- using using that to create the perfect person. Like we can breed the perfect person if the right people have babies and then those babies have babies with the right people and so on and so forth and so on and so forth, right? Um, this led to all kinds of horrible things like um, you know, ethnic cleansings and, uh, and r- ridiculous experiments and um, uh, a lot of uh, stopping certain groups of people from having children that were considered undesirable. And, and Tomoe fits right into this. I mean, he literally, the whole reason that he is a, you know, perfect vessel uh, for Master Pharaoh 90 to use is because he doesn't believe in bodily autonomy. Quite literally, he wants to create the perfect being. And that's what he does or what he's trying to do with creating the Death Busters. Now, instead of actually creating uh, perfect beings to serve him, he uh, he creates, you know, these these beings that realize their own autonomy and uh, and uh, are not super on board with everything going on. But um, which in the itself whole, is a is yeah it, is also an allusion to World War Two. Uh. Yes, yes, exactly. So like, and and this is a huge departure from the '90s anime. Now it is like this in the manga. Okay, yes. but in the anime, it's like super softened. 
it's like super softened. And I, and I went and grabbed, I went and re- we went and reread the wiki article just to make sure we remembered this correctly. But like, uh, what do you remember about Dr. Tomoe from the 90s anime? He's quite different. He was a victim. Yes. He, he was a victim. He was a loving father who sacrificed himself and his mind in order to save his daughter. And Pharaoh 90 took him over when he gave that sacrifice to like save his daughter. And so he was never really himself and I remember I remember watching that and like loving that because like you know that's a great story and then watching Crystal and seeing it be so different uh because that's an incredibly different story right like the the idea of like even that affects Haruta that like it's like oh the difference between a father sacrificed himself and is now this evil villain has been doing these things to my to me and my father has been doing these things to me are two vastly different stories yes and it's like it makes it totally different so in the 90s anime at the end when uh when Hotaru's reborn as the baby they actually return the baby to Tomoe <laughs> And then when it's time to go collect her back so that she can be in the show again, they go and like retrieve the baby, the infant baby from him, from his list, like chill house in the city. And it's just like, all right. And then we never see him again. <laughs> in the 90s. It's, it's ridiculous. It it's is, ridiculous. Yeah. Um, I love I, this version is so much better. It's so much more impactful. But I guess they thought, it, you know, in the 90s, it was different in the 90s, guys. Like you remember, we had no idea that um that anybody would ever flirt with fascism again mm-hmm. we thought we had stomped it out we like we thought it was gone we thought like oh you know what we're beyond that we're not we're not going to have fash problems again well you know oh, what that's also, not true in the 20 teens and yeah, so they they brought also, back the manga version <laughs> again there was also like a censorship of it yes. too of like the the 90s the 90s as great as they were was also an era of less information is better yeah. Uh, and that was like the idea of, you know, that's when abstinence is at a high, a high time. And I know that this is American ideals, but it does play but, into but it. In, in Japan, Ooh. a lot of similar stuff, too. Yes. I mean, the the when I'm talking about those changes to the 90s anime, I don't mean that the dub fucked with it. No, like, it's Japan. No, it's the, yeah, yeah, Japan fucked with it. Um, but, but I do mean like this was just kind of the culture of America and a lot of places because of how America's influenced, especially Japan, because Japan has a lot of American influence because of the aftermath of World War II, uh, it, it, there was a lot of taken from that. So there was an idea of less information for the mass people is better. So the idea of like having fascism and active, like an actively hateful, terrible father figure in a show geared towards children is not giving le- like less information. It should be pal- palatable towards the people that they are trying to connect with the show. And at that point it was children. Um, yes. And so like it, children, meaning like the preteen teenager era. So let us, let us censor it for lack of a better word. That's what it was, it was censorship. Uh, and then all of a sudden now we're like, oh, just kidding. Uh, we are in the age of information we are in the age of children not only being able to handle this stuff but intellectually being able to understand it and dissect it so let's talk about it well also I think it's like it's just different it's totally different no Garnet you're I mean you're on the right track friend um like it, it, it's different now like in the 90s we really had no idea that any of this stuff was ever going to come back like and I know that sounds like really stupid but like we didn't we were stupid um and now we have the internet and uh and there's like you know uh, red pill bros and there's like maga bs and there's actually fash things going on and it's not just in America Japan is having problems with um with fash stuff getting popular again too um, it's all over. It's all over the world. This is happening um, because of the inequality going on right now in the world. And it's it's just it's a natural state. Um, anybody that studied this stuff can tell you. And we've talked about it in previous streams when it's relevant. Uh, it is the natural state of of the current political landscape that we have where we all are running capitalist economies or we've all got basically social democracies that whenever you have inequality rise you also have a rise in fascist ideology and socialist ideology right and 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 so we've got a fash problem again 
And again, it's important to remember that like, even though Japan is its own society, has its own in like culture, after World War II, much of its uh, military, much of its government was kind of taken over by America because of the consequences of what World War II was part of their agreement to, to like, to, to stop the war. Yeah. Um, and it was like, so we, we, we did a, you did a bad, you did, you did a fasci thing. You don't get to have a military anymore. The, yeah. So the fascism, the fascism that exists in the United States did bubble over and have a direct response in Japan and has continued to influence their government and their military uh, because they're uh, reliant on America for a lot or the United States of America for a lot of these things. So like that is an important thing to remember in all this that even though their culture is different, even though the capitalism that exists in Japan, still capitalism is different. That's the direct correlation between these two things and why they're so in line time wise with each other. Yep. So they're 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 having some they're having a problem with it too, just like mm-hmm. we are. Um, <laughs> so yay, uh, and and so I think it's quite appropriate that we kind of that that Sailor Moon Crystal when it was built when they were creating it they decided, okay, yes, we're definitely going to go back to the manga in this part, and when we're not just going to go back to it, we're going to uh, you know continue and emphasize it. And so mm-hmm. Tomoe goes back to being the evil uh, geneticist that he was in the manga and he um absolutely saves the villains in this series he's the only one that is interesting at all yes (laughs) and um i mean amazingly he's the one that has the connection to the girls and the connection to the theme and he's interesting maybe if they would have done that with the rest of the villains but they didn't and I think that if they had like integrated that more if they had like truly made like they integrated him a lot, but if they had been found a way to like really truly make that there weren't so many villains, because I feel like that that's also where the downfall was, where it was to- you you know you're part you're paying attention to Tomoe, but you're also paying attention to Mrs. No- Mistress Nine, and then also Pharaoh Ninety, and then also everybody else. That it's like oh, if you had just kept it with like three levels, you had the minions, you had Doctor, and then you had the the actual mass person leading everything that might have actually been more successful. So you're saying cut Mistri- Mistress Nine. What well, that's what you're saying, cut Mistress Nine. Honestly, it probably would have made it better if we would have yeah. just had the Deathbusters reporting directly to Tomoe instead of having Mistress Nine in the middle there. Mm-hmm. Um, it's just that would this would this plot would the would the plot the way that it is in the manga? Um, yeah, actually, that probably would have that would have solved a lot of problems. It I love the Witches Five as a concept too, but they're not I actually good. <laughs> they're not, and but like I, I would have. I think that that would have just been more impactful, and yeah. it would have been able to show, uh, Tomoe connected a little bit more instead of his own little subset of everything, yeah. uh, which is kind of what he was. It, it would have just been better if he was actually involved in part of the evil process. Yeah, because it kind of comes out of left field. He's like. He's like, by the way, I created the Death Busters. And you're like, yes. really? Because it's been Mistress Nine leading them this whole time. <laughs> but you made them. So, okay, cool. Yeah. So if he if he had that connection, if we, the audience, knew that from the very beginning, I think it would have hired the stakes. And it also would have like been able to tell a little bit more of an intense story when it came to um, uh, Chibiusa and Horatu's relationship. Yes. Of, like, it would have been like, no, you are at the bad guy's house <laughs> like the big bad guy's house please <laughs> please go away <laughs> <laughs> yes yes exactly for sure so yeah um in conclusion dr tomoe is is the best villain in sailor moon and he's also a nazi yes he is that's <laughs> he, is, he is we're gonna call him as we see it he is a nazi mm-hmm. he is into eugenics uh he experiments on people including his own daughter and he does not believe in bodily autonomy or consent. At all. And he would be perfectly fine with the whole world burning, if only to just be right. Yep. He he would That's be, true. he is the kind of man that is okay with dying as long as he's proven right. It's true. But the World and War II stuff does not stop there. It's not no, just like- home away. That's the important thing too, is that I think that uh, so much of like our cultures are shown in our media. And that's something that I really appreciate 
as an American being able to like see these things in this media. So let's talk about what's next. That was like really impactful for me. So you guys know Landon doesn't pay attention to the animation, but in this season she did. And she noticed something that was very interesting about the final battle. What is this? What is the, the like cloud of like uh, the destruction that master Pharaoh 90 uh, summons? What does it kind of look like? So for me, just backstory, I have been to, I have been very fortunate enough to go to Hiroshima twice uh, to see the devastation of the nuclear weapon or the uh, atom bomb, sorry, the atom bomb that went off uh, and the destruction of the city is so similar to photos, to videos and to like the remnants that exist in Hiroshima today that I was just like blown away about how unsubtle the world war ii imagery was of the destruction of the city and um, i mean it, and i don't think and i think even if you don't know that like it looks a little mushroom cloudy doesn't it yeah just no, yeah it I mean, I, and that's not a mistake that's not a mistake and and we're even talking like post mushroom cl- when you have like close-ups on on sailor moon like scouting over the city as it's destroyed like it looks like an atom bomb went off and it it got me thinking just a lot about like how media presents imageries like this in in media and like thinking of um it, what I was really comparing it to was Avengers uh and the <laughs> final Avengers movie and the destroying yeah. <laughs> the destroying of the city of New York mm-hmm. City and what that looked like and that it was like you know giant aliens crashing and flying aliens crashing into buildings and buildings kind of being destroyed but still there um and the utter ruin and devastation that existed in this city destroying thing and like the difference between those two and how really those imageries like how this encom- like encompasses Japanese viewpoints of what destroyed cities and a destroyed world would look like and how impactful and different it is because we haven't had anything like that here happen in America. Nope. No, not really. Um, Lady also hates fascists. So she's just here to tell you guys about that. Um, She says, I was a fascist. She says, bash, bash. Bash, bash. (laughs) So, so yeah, I think that, I think that it's, um, it's like really, when you go back and you watch this season with World War II in mind, I think it's like, oh, oh, this is the this is the uh, eugenic season. This is why it's all about bodies. This is why the in the final battle, Sailor Moon has to literally dive into the mushroom cloud. Um, and uh, and then amazingly, well, as you always do in Sailor Moon, save everyone with the power of friendship. If only it, if only you could save Nazis with the power of friendship, wouldn't that be only. fantastic? Um, but you can't. You have to have Sailor Saturn come and utterly destroy them. That's well, the only also, way. Yeah, it's like that whole level of also rebirth. Like, yes. in a way that the American culture hasn't had to do, Japan did. Uh, even though it didn't destroy the entire countryside, it destroyed the entire economic. It de- it destroyed a lot of the societal systems in place. It destroyed a lot of things that the world really did have to rebirth itself. Like the, the Japan really had to rebirth itself after the aftermath of World War II. And so like this concept of like what rebirth means and what it looks like in a Japanese media, even though it's being consumed by Americans is, I, it, it, it's beautiful. And yeah. it's, it really is telling. And if you are capable of looking at it through a Japanese scope or, or a view set, even if it's a minor one, it's, it's an interesting how different the story changes. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And this is why this season is my favorite. Yes. It is, to me, the most symbolic of things that I care about. It talks, um, it speaks to me politically and it speaks to me in regards to gender and sexuality um, in a way that just elevates Sailor Moon from being something that's like, oh, it's this nice romance about the power of friendship. And I love that shit. Like, don't get me wrong. But this is why this season is my favorite compared to the others, because it also is like, you know, a little bit like, hey, these are my political opinions. And um, and I, I think that, you know, we could we could do some work here 
and uh, and I just I freaking love it. Yeah, freaking love it. If you've been watching the show, you know that Karen and I love to talk about the impact and worldview on media and mm-hmm. the way that uh, it's portrayed and how the creators of m- things that exist in media really are just telling on themselves. Uh, And that is my favorite part about stuff like this. I love plot. I love character development. What I really want to do is deep, deep into the mind of the creator and be able to like take out all these lessons that we've learned um, or that it's trying to teach us. And I've been missing that with the last two uh, seasons, because even though I love to talk about the themes that we did talk about, it wasn't as overt. This is bigger. But this is bigger. This is really showing a hand on a political level that I can understand. I'm not a Japanese woman. I don't know what it's like to be, I cannot speak on the idea of being a woman and gender in, in Japan and like get the nuances that the show most definitely has. But this is a nuance that I can pick up. And I've repeat, and I've like, that's something that I've really enjoyed about the season is being able to pick up on, on that stuff. It's great. It's great. It's season so three is great. Well, I think I, I said I, this for season two, but guess what? You could watch this season standalone too without the others and just, and just have like a, a grand old time. So, yeah. You, you might know. be like, who are those four other scouts? But other than that, you'd really enjoy it. <laughs> yes, yes. You'd be like, do they even say their names? <laughs> <laughs> Oh gosh. Yeah. But I think Mm -hmm. that kind of leads us into the final question that we ask every time. And that is, did it resonate? Karen, did this season resonate? Resoundingly? Yes. Favorite season. I know that Crystal hasn't gotten to the Sailor Stars arc yet with Cosmos and all of that. And we're going to, that movie is releasing apparently summer 2023. Don't worry when it comes out, we'll do an episode. We'll do our schedule. We already put it on there. Yeah, we already decided like it's happening. Um, but uh, but in, until I can see Crystal's version of that, this season, absolute favorite season when it comes to uh, to Crystal as a version of Sailor Moon. And this season, there's so much that I love about it in other versions too. But Crystal nails the things that I love the most about this season. So, so good. Absolutely resonates with me. It resonates with me on a gender level, on a political level. Um, I absolutely love Usagi and Mamoru's relationship. It feels very real to me and the way that I, as an adult, attempt to navigate my relationships. Um, and then on top of that, just like the animation is so good. It's so beautiful. <laughs> so, yes. It resonates more than any of the other seasons for me. Um, Landon, what about you? Does Sailor Moon Crystal season three resonate? It resonates on almost every aspect. The queer kid in me is thrilled. Uh, The woman in me is amazed. I love the concept politically. I love being able to connect it to international relations. That is a huge uh, passion of mine. I love the storytelling. I love the character developments that exist, the nuance that is required for a lot of the characters' stories that are being told this this season. Uh, It makes the writer in me incredibly happy. It makes the viewer in me incredibly happy. Uh, I, I got all of those fun nostalgic tingles with watching this season that I kind of missed out on last season. Uh, it It's amazing and it 100% resonates and I will gladly recommend, especially this season to anyone. Mm-hmm. Yes, absolutely love it. Mm-hmm. All right. All right, that leads us into where to follow us. What are we doing next week? Uh, we've hinted to it several times, but next week we'll watch part one and part two of the movie uh, for, oh my gosh, it's not Cosmos. Sailor Moon Eternal. 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 Thank Sailor you. Moon Eternal. <laughs> yes. Name so all you Chibi Yusa lovers out there, definitely come hang out with us next week because we're going to be talking all about Sailor Moon Eternal. Chibi Yusa and, and Helios yes. favorite thing favorite thing ever oh uh, <laughs> o- that's not true that is uh that would be osagi and mamaru but secondary otp mm-hmm. absolutely <laughs> uh and we're gonna talk all about it next time yes um also next week on thursday for artistic license we're going to be continuing some more of the optional bosses 
for Final Fantasy X. So if you'd like me to like to see me continue on those, join me there. You can find all of my VODs on the YouTubes. So you definitely want to go there to find all of our past episodes because they don't stay forever on Twitch. So if you want to find the older VODs, you got to go to my YouTube channel. We've already covered season one and season two of Sailor Moon. So you can find those there. Um, and, uh, as well as, oh gosh, so many other fun things that we have covered. So you can go find all of that there. And, uh, you also want to be following my Twitter. That's where you're going to get the latest updates on everything that's going on with me. It is my main social media. So it is my most up to date. If you want to make sure that you are getting all of the correct notifications for my content, that's when YouTube videos go up. That's when, um, when streams go live, you want to be in the discord because we cannot trust Twitch or YouTube to push your notifications out, even if you tell it you want them. So you, um, you want to be in the discord because I control the notifications there. So that's all the places that you can find me. You can support me in all of the usual ways, subscribing bits, um, all that fun stuff. Um, I have not forgotten Garnet about doing your pin for your sub today. Yes. So we're going to do that afterwards. But before we do that, Landon, where can everyone find you? You can find me on Twitter and Instagram at land in Maine. Uh, Instagram has been popping recently. So go ahead and go over there. Uh, that's about it for me. I'm kind of boring at the moment. Do you still have your, um, your school books yes. thing pinned? Is that still my, yes. Yeah, so the Amazon list is, uh, the Amazon list is, uh, on my Instagram is for my classroom library. We there's recently, this is T we recently found out that our district is no longer pers- is no longer purchasing books for classroom libraries and everything's just going to go to the regular library uh, but it's incredibly important for kids to have diverse books to read in class so uh, it is completely 100% funded by myself and lovely friends families and fans so if you are willing to donate or if there's something that you want to recommend please reach out 100% or, or please donate if you can if not no pressure uh, but uh, yeah that's what I got <laughs> so if you want to help out Landon's kids, you can do that. Thank you so much for the applause, Kitty. Landon can live another week. Thank you so much. Thank, Thank you so much you. Thank you for joining the Discord, Garnet. Okay, but I didn't forget. Here we go. So every time that we have a new subscriber, we pull a pin from the, the pin bucket. Okay. I I this is my childhood pin collection that I recently found when we moved. So so let's see what pin we get. Okay, I'm not looking. I'm not looking. What pin are we gonna pull? Okay, here we go. What is this? Oh, this is um this is Timon about to have a, a beautiful bug snack. So truly, there you go. We're gonna add that. We're gonna add that to the pin for Timon. <gasps> Thank you, Sailor Garnet, for following me. Ah. There we go. I had to use my teeth to get the back off. Okay, let's add it to All right, there we go. So, so pretty. Added to the pin curtain. Thank, thank you so much for your sub, um, Garnet. And uh, let's go. Let, let me go find somebody for us to raid for raid, today. Raid, 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 raid. Ooh, okay, let's see who's live. Let's see who's live. Oh, who of my friends are live today? Let's see. Let's see. Um, do to do. Okay. Oh, okay. Um, Lady Sushi is live again playing Kingdom Hearts. I think let's go. Let's go raid Lady Sushi. Kingdom Hearts. Let me make sure I've got her name right. I think she's Sushi with two eyes. Yes, she's Sushi with two eyes. All right, there we go. We're gonna go ahead and raid Lady Sushi. Some Kingdom Hearts. Um, we love Kingdom Hearts here. The Landon also doesn't play video games, but she has played yeah. Kingdom Hearts. So yes, I do. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Thank you guys so much for watching. And don't forget, of course, as always, to make it a great day. And don't forget to be awesome. All right. Bye, y'all. See bye. you later.